All right, let's talk about work. So work, uh, you know, obviously we use this in our vernacular every day and stuff like that. I mean, physics has a very specific definition. So work, in order for work to be accomplished, what actually has to happen? You have to apply a force, that's not enough. If I push on something and it doesn't move, have I done, have I done any work? No, it's also got to experience a displacement here. So and in the sense that the force and the displacement are in the same direction, that's when the maximum work will be achieved. If they're in opposite directions, we'd have cosine of 180, and what would be true? You'd actually get negative work. So if your force and your displacement are opposite directions, that's actually when you get negative work. So performed by a force and stuff like that. So work is energy here, and what is the SI unit for energy? Joules. So, anybody tell me what a joule actually is based on looking at this equation? Uh, a couple different ways to look at it, but you use joules in your definition of joules. Um, but in this case, just look at this equation, what would it have to be? Yeah. If I wanted to break it down further, what might I do? Yeah, take f Newtons for force. Kilogram meter per second squared, substitute it in, and you get you know, your definition of joules. But joules is our SI unit for work. It's our SI unit for energy. We're going to talk about both kinetic and potential energy in a little bit. One thing to note, we might also write work. Your book does it this way, and I like calling D for displacement, but technically, you might also see it as F cosine theta delta x, which is kind of the more proper and more customary uh, symbol for displacement. Cool. So let's just dive right in to see how this applies. So question number one. So how much work is performed by a person lifting a 100 kilogram object at constant velocity to a height of two meters? Okay, so we don't know how much work they're performing in this case. So if they're lifting this object at constant velocity, what's the big, uh, why do I bother telling you that it's a constant velocity? So no acceleration, which means no net force. No net force. So if we look at this here, let's get a free body diagram. What forces are acting on this object? Yeah, it's got its own weight. So let's, you know, let's make this a proper free body diagram. And so then what's opposing that? So with just some lifting force, somebody's lifting this object up. So, and in this case, we can say that the sum of the forces equals ma, so Newton's second law. But in this case, as you pointed out, Chris, there is no acceleration. So if there's no acceleration, then the sum of the forces adds up to zero. All right, so in this case, we're gonna have F minus mg equals zero, and we can see that our lifting force has to be equal to the object's weight. So what does that object's weight come out to in this case? What is it? There we go. 980 Newtons. There's our lifting force. So now if we want to solve for work here, so work equals F cosine theta times your displacement. So we found out our lifting force is 980 Newtons. What is the angle, so between our force and between the two meter displacement? So in this case, lifting force is up, so it's zero. So in this case, our lifting force is up, our displacement's up, so in this case, then what's cosine of zero? One. One, so I'm just gonna leave it out. And then our displacement of two meters. And so what do we get for a work here? Yeah, 1,960, and what are the units? Joules. Cool. So the other question here is, what is the work performed by gravity during this same lifting? So what's gonna be different here? So. Yeah, it'd be cosine of 180. So in this case, we get the same calculation here. So set it up, work equals F cosine theta times displacement. And in this case, what is the force due to gravity? Well, it's still 
980 newtons. But in this case, we're going to do cosine of 180 degrees, which is negative 1, so and our displacement of 2 meters. And in this case, what's our work going to come out to? Negative 19. Good. Negative 1960 joules. Totally makes sense because gravity points down, our displacement points up, and that's when you get negative work. So we'll learn a formula in a little bit here. In fact, why don't we just introduce it now? But it says that your net work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Now, kinetic energy, we haven't formally described it yet, but I'm going to count on the fact that you kind of have an idea of what it is. So what do you have to be doing if you, in order to have kinetic energy? Got to be moving. So and in this case, you got to be moving. So in this case, to change your velocity, i.e. change your kinetic energy, there has to be net work performed. So in this case, we've got two forces acting on this object. One of them performs 1,960 joules worth of work. The other negative 1,960 joules worth of work. What is the net work performed on this object? Zero. And so it's, does its kinetic energy change? No. Does its velocity change, therefore? No, but we already knew that, right? Because you were told in the problem that it was moving at constant velocity. That's why it actually worked out, that the net work ends up being zero. Therefore, there's no change in the kinetic energy. Cool. All right, question number two. Remember this pulley system? So how many opportunities to tension this wire get a chance to pull up on this lovely object? Six times. So here, 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 and here. So in this case, if we wanted to say, you know, look at this in terms of mass, how much mass is each opportunity responsible for pulling up on? Four kilograms, but that's mass. It's really a force we got to apply. And so what force would be required to then lift up four kilograms? Four times 9.8. So, and that comes out to just below 40 newtons, if you guys recall. So tension in this string is going to be just under 40 newtons. Anybody get it for me exactly? If you recall, we actually said, six times the tension in that rope ends up equaling mg. It's 39 point something, anybody? 32? Okay, so we figured that out a couple lectures ago. So in this case, I actually want to know how much work is done in raising this 24, gram, uh, 24 kilogram object uh, at constant velocity one meter high. So in this case, look at our formula for work. Work again equals F cosine theta times displacement. So in this case, our tensions are pulling directly up and our displacement's going to be directly up as well. So what's cosine theta going to be? Yeah, we're going to cosine of zero is one. We're just going to ignore the cosine theta part of this. The force and the displacement are aligned. So we can kind of uh, simplify this a little bit. In this case, we know our force is 39.2 newtons. So now we got a problem. We've got to multiply by a displacement. Hold on to that thought for just a second. So instead of using this pulley system, let's say I just wanted to lift this mass myself and lift it up. So let's calculate the work in that regard. So again, force time displacement. So I'm going to be lifting straight up, and my force and displacement will point the same direction. So how much force will I have to generate without the pulley system? Same. Without the pulley system? Oh. Without the pulley? I'm going to have to lift the entire weight myself, right? Yeah, 24 kilograms times, so mg, 24 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared gets you? 235.2. And how high do I want to lift it? One meter. And so how much work must be done? 235.2. Good, 235.2 joules. So now, I want to do it with the pulley system, right? And I notice I use six times less force. Life is good. And how... How much of a displacement do I want? One meter. So is it going to take as much work to do it with the pulley system? No. Doesn't seem like it, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. So what you have to realize is what am I actually applying the force to in this diagram if I'm the one causing the overall force? The rope. And as I pull this rope, I might pull it a meter, 
but by the time it wriggles its way all through this, it doesn't rise a meter. So it turns out, so if I get a mechanical advantage of six times less force here, I have to pull this six times further to get it up one meter. So in this case, when I pull on this rope, I don't have to pull it one meter, I have to pull it six meters. And if we do that, what's that work come out to? Yeah, 235.2 joules. There's no such thing as a free lunch. I can use less force, but the amount of energy that's gonna be required is exactly the same whether I use the pulley system or not. Cool. I mean, it's intuitive that when you pull one and then it's one six, but I wanna figure out what's the mathematical reason. So, well, think, think about it this way. So if I'm pulling, let's just say I pull horizontal. The diagram kind of shows I'm pulling down. Yeah. But let's just say I'm pulling horizontal. Yeah. So if I pull this one meter, does it translate that this should all rise one meter? So think about, think about it this way. If I pull one meter this way, how, how high is this one gonna rise? It's definitely gonna rise one meter. Cool, it's just the same rope. I haven't wrapped it around multiple things or anything like that. So let's shorten this up a little bit. Um, Yeah, let's take out six. So let's do just two. I think this will be a lot easier to see. So let's just say it's hooked to the ceiling right there. So if you notice, as I pull this rope, if I want this to go up one meter, then I need it to go up one meter on this side and one meter on this side, right? Yes. Which means how far do I have to pull the rope? Two meters. So for every pulley that wheel that's attached to the mass, I've got to pull twice as far. It's really weird. It is it really weird. It doesn't matter how far those uh, wheels are. Nope. It doesn't matter how far the wheels are it's apart or anything like that. Has to be yep. For every wheel attached to the mass, yep. Sides. I gotta shorten it on both sides. Right. By the time I hook up two more wheels, I've got to shorten it on six sides. Yeah. Yes, that makes sense. Cool. All right, so number three. So we've got an object on a horizontal surface. There's a coefficient of friction between the object and the surface of 0 0.2. We're going to pull with 60 newtons on this object, but not perfectly horizontally, 30 degrees below the horizontal instead. Cool, we're going to move this thing two meters, displacement, a horizontal displacement of two meters, and we want to know how much work is done by this pulling force, but also how much work is done by friction in the process. So in this case, if we do a free body diagram, we've got one force on there. What's the other force we're going to have? Yeah, friction, which would be mu times the normal force. But then also in the y direction, we'll have the weight and the normal force. And that's why the normal force will equal the weight. They're in equilibrium, so they're equal and opposite. So in this case, oh, you're right, they're not. Why are they not? Ooh, because I'm pulling downward with this guy, which is going to make the normal force greater than the weight. Got to compensate for that. All right. So coming back to that, if we set up um, our work equation for this pulling force. So in this case, we've got a force of 60 newtons. So, and what's our angle between our force and our displacement? Yeah, it is 30 degrees. So cosine 30. So, and what's our overall displacement? Two meters. Two meters. And so what does our work come out to? Well, 103.1. 103.1? Sweet. 103.9 what? Uh, Great. So that's the work done by our pulling force. All right, now what about the work done by friction? So in here we have to, we're gonna have a little fun. So friction is mu times normal force. So we know mu, do we know the normal force yet? Well, it's not though, right? Because I'm not just pulling to the right, I'm also pulling down. So in this case, we set up the sum of the forces in the y direction here. Some of the forces equals ma. Is there an overall acceleration in the
direction, no. So this goes to zero in this case. So we have normal force pointing up, I'll make it positive. We have the weight pulling down, I'll make that negative. And then what component of this force also points down? Yeah, 60 newtons times sine 30. And this all adds up to zero. So let's solve for this normal force here. Uh, what was our mass on this object? 10 kilograms. Sine of 30 is a half, so 60 times sine 30 is 30 newtons. And so. It, <laughs> so 10 times 9.8 is 98, plus 30 is 128. Sweet. Okay, so there's our normal force. So now we can figure out the work done by friction. So the work done by friction, F cosine theta times your displacement. We just figured out our force is 128 newtons. What's our angle? What's the angle between the force of friction and the displacement of, t yeah. 180 degrees, they're exactly opposite, which means what should work come out to in the end? Negative. Negative. And what's our displacement again? Don't we have to do what? Oh, I forgot my, oh, let's rewind. So I just got the normal force. I don't want to plug the normal force in. Let's go back a step. Awesome. So in this case, our force of friction is mu times normal force. Great, angle is 180 degrees, exactly opposite, negative work, and displacement of two meters. Let's try that again. Negative 51.2 joules. 51.2 joules. Okay, so let me ask you a question now. So the work done by our pulling force here is 103.9 joules. The work done by friction is negative 51.2 joules. Is network performed on this object? Yes, and if network's performed, what's true? Yeah. Work energy theorem says that if network's performed on an object, it'll have a change in kinetic energy. So in this case, overall, positive work or negative work? positive work. So in the direction of the displacement, it will also have an increase in kinetic energy here. So this thing is not moving at constant velocity. In fact, once we've moved it two meters, it actually has a velocity at that point. So we're just capturing a snapshot in time. So it is not motionless after we've displaced it here.